Uh, good morning. So, although it might not be morning when you're watching this, I have not posted uh, my supplementary video lectures for a few weeks now, um, partly because I was away at a conference um, and, and partly because I felt that we still needed to accrue a bit, mo a bit more um, uh, in terms of our terminological tool toolkit and also um, our familiarity with different modes of critical reading before I started uh, putting up more videos. Uh, and, and so now, especially as we move into this next week, uh, we just touched on new historicism at the end of last week, and this week we're moving into questions of identity, questions of the relationship between environment and human, uh, questions about the relationship between human and an animal, which will really um, open us up to a slew of other modes of uh, critical engagement with literature. Uh, um, and because we're about to move into a new a new field of literature, a literary study that's invested in questions of ethics and politics and culture, specifically um, cultural practices. What I want to do is look back at the uh, other modes of critical engagement that we've studied and model for you um, some idealized approaches to literature. Uh, and I use that word idealized carefully because what I mean by it is that, um, like I said in class, there is no one who really just does new criticism anymore, or just does reader response criticism anymore, or just does post-structuralist criticism anymore. So really what I'm about to model for you should be taken as really just a, a sort of uh, thought exercise or thought experiment in getting us to uh, look, at it, look at the same text in different ways. Okay. And so, um, uh, so what I'd like to do is um, look at Mary Robinson's uh, A London Summer Morning, which we talked about last time, and, and really just experiment with what this poem might look like if I tried to inhabit the ideal position of a new critic or the ideal position of a reader response critic or the ideal position of a deconstructivist. Uh, and at the end of the lecture series, anticipate some ways or directions or um, sort of um, lines of inquiry that a new historicist, if I were one of those, uh, and I'm not, but if I were one of those, um, what I might do or where I might begin to look um, uh, for my research. Okay, so I've written most of the lecture out uh, as I did in, uh, in a few earlier lectures and as I do in other videos uh, on my YouTube channel. So I hope that even though I'm reading the lecture to you as opposed to uh, uh, sort of frantically engaging with the camera um, uh, off the cuff, that it will still seem uh, useful and insightful to you. Okay. Um, actually, I'm gonna, I have my keyboard sticking into my stomach here, so I'm going to push that in. Okay. So the beginning of my lecture will, will repeat some of what I just said. Here we go. What I will be modeling in this video lecture is a set of idealized readings of a single poem that illustrate how our object of knowledge, the works of literature we are studying, uh, changes when we frame it in different ways or interrogate it with a different uh, with a different set of concerns or concepts in mind. This lecture series is, to use a difficult phrase I mentioned during our very first class, an epistemological performance. Before I begin, I want to make one thing clear. What I will be modeling will not really look like literary scholarship, as it is currently being done by professors of literature today. Literary scholarship involves far more than a close reading that can be communicated in 10 minutes, okay, or even less. Regardless, these videos should still give you some insight into the history of how literature has been studied, interpreted, and taught over the past several decades in the United States, and how close reading, even if it is not really the telos of literary scholarship anymore, is still, you know, uh, a pretty uh, pretty basic and fundamental tool or skill set that one needs to develop in order to do other kinds of scholarship. Um, so before we get to it, though, I thought I would reread um, for us Mary Robinson's poem, A London Summer Morning, uh, published in or written in 1794, published 
posthumously in 1804. I think Robinson died in 1800, right on uh, the, the beginning of that century, the beginning of the 19th century. Okay, so this poem is, if I'm not mistaken, 42 lines long. Okay, so it'll take a couple minutes to get through it. A London summer morning. You can see my page is, <laughs> my page is pretty marked up, so I'll try to, try to make my way through it. Who has not waked to list the busy sounds of summer morning in the sultry smoke of noisy London? On the pavement hot, the sooty chimney boy with dingy face and tattered covering shrilly hawks his trade, rousing the sleepy housemaid. At the door, the milk pail rattles and the tinkling bell proclaims the dustman's office, while the street is lost in clouds impervious. Now begins the din of hackney coaches, wagons, carts, while tinmen's shops and noisy trunk makers, knife grinders, coopers, squealing cork cutters, fruit barrows, and the hunger giving cries of vegetable vendors fills, fill the air. Now every shop displays its varied trade, and the fresh sprinkled pavement cools the feet of early walkers. At the private door, the rudy housemaid twirls the busy mop, annoying the smart prentice or neat girl tripping with bandbox lightly. Now the sun darts burning splendor on the glittering pane, save where the canvas awning throws a shade on the gay merchandise. Now spruce and trim in shops, where beauty smiles with industry, sits the smart damsel while the passenger peeps through the window, watching every charm. Now pastry dainties catch the eyes uh, minute, eyes minute of hummy insects, minute of hummy insects, and minute while the slimy snare waits to enthrall them. Now the lamplighter mounts the slight ladder, nimbly venturous, to trim the half-filled lamp while at his feet the potboy yells discordant. All along the sultry pavement, the old clothes man cries in tone monotonous and sidelong views the area for his traffic. Now the bag is slyly opened and the half-worn suit sometimes the pilfered treasure of the base domestic spoiler, for one half its worth sinks in the green abyss. The porter now bears his huge load along the burning way, and the poor poet wakes from busy dreams to paint the summer morning. Okay. Um, what I think I might do is now just quickly go through i see there's a little bit a little bit of time so what i'd like to do is go through the new critical approach to this poem first and then i'll um maybe stop it and continue on in in a, in the next video okay if i were an ideal new critic i might begin my reading of this poem by cataloging cataloging all of the tensions or meaning com meaningful comparisons at work paying particular attention to ironies ambiguities and paradoxes we do so, as Cleanth Brooks famously writes, in order to observe what he calls the structure of the poem, quote, a structure of meanings, evaluations, and interpretations, end quote, which is reigned over by what he also calls a principle of unity that, quote, balances and harmonizes connotations, attitudes, and meanings, end quote, bringing together, quote, the like and the unlike, end quote. So what does Robinson's poem harmonize? What ambiguities does it pose and seek to resolve? First, I notice a tension in the poem between the common and the uncommon. The opening question of the poem, go back and read it, if read as a rhetorical question, connotes a common experience of Londoners or those who have visited London. And yet the poem employs a variety of poetic devices in order to render the experience, this common experience, somewhat uncommon, producing a cacophony, a balanced cacophony of sounds that one would normally experience one at a time or in an unintelligible and seemingly indistinguishable jumble. In short, it produces a song, using as its content what is really just the noise of a London summer morning, quote, the busy sounds of noisy London. End quote. What are we to do as readers and critics with this contrast or contradiction 
between uncommon and common, which first manifests as a tension between verse and noise. Having noticed a couple of interesting tensions in the poem already, and accepting that I could have noticed something entire, else entirely, I nevertheless make a decision as an ideal new critic to investigate how this dynamic of the common and uncommon recurs throughout the poem, and to see whether or not the poem manages to resolve noise and song satisfactorily. Immediately, I notice the purported commonness of the occupations associated with the noise of the morning, chimney boy, housemaid, and dustman. The commonness here is complex, common in the sense that there are many, many Londoners filling these roles. Um, hence, they are nameless because there are so many of them. One dustman could not collect all the waste from the houses in the city. They are also common in that they are privileged, well-paid, uh, not, excuse me, pre privileged, well-paid positions. Um, they're, um, they're probably lower class, right? Certainly lower class. They're also common in the sense that they are low, concerned with the common good of others, cleaning chimneys for others, removing trash for others, arranging the domestic space for others. The sounds are also non-poetic, quote, shrilly hawks, milk pail rattles, the tinkling bell. Yet the poem arranges these sounds as a, an organic set of interrelated parts, which affect each other in unintended ways. For instance, the boy in need of work, the chimney boy, wakes up the maid, and all three work together, again unintentionally, seemingly unaware of one another, to anticipate the much more impressive din of small shops and tradesmen to follow. Quote, now begins the din of hackney coaches, wagons, carts, while tinmen's shops and noisy trunk makers, knife grinders, coopers, squealing cork cutters, fruit barrows, and the hunger giving cries of vegetable vendors fill the air. If this were a longer essay and not just a short video lecture, I might enumerate all the fine sonic qualities of this passage its rhythmic punctuation, its alliteration and assonance, its surprising arrangement of sound and sense. For now, I will just say that an ideal new critic might begin to see a paradox forming in these lovely lines. Namely, that though these sounds, when experienced in real life collectively or individually, are mere common noise of the poor and the laborious and even annoying, that they are here transcoded into a song without ceasing to be noisy. The greatest quality of a London summer morning, perhaps, is that it miraculously demonstrates that a noisy din can become an admirable chorus. In poetry, it can, without losing its commonness, become for a few lines uncommon, a demonstration of remarkable multiplicity, sublime enormity, and urban diversity. The poem cleverly bestows even the sun's blessing, usually reserved, reserved in other poems of this period for the skylark or the season or a daisy or a river or a mountain, on wares and goods protected by an awning, gay merchandise that grows all the more enticing to early morning walkers when seen or experienced poetically as part of an organic living harmony. This reading is supported by the very last image of the poem, the image of the only one who speaks the language that is needed or capable of capturing the common uncommonly. Quote, and the poor poet, note the poor, which makes him or her common too, an embodiment of the common uncommon paradox. And the poor poet, to continue, quote, wakes from a busy dreams to paint the summer morning. End quote. By the final line, we come full circle, not only to the opening question, but to the title itself. The poet faces the seemingly impossible challenge of translating the overwhelming noise into something to read, something to perceive, something to be painted, something that we might see with new eyes. Okay. In my next video, I'll come back and think about how, uh, while that may be a sort of satisfactory way to account for the meaning of the poem, that it's about balancing common and uncommon, and is and thus a sort of statement about how poetry can imbue the uncommon with a with at least a sort of provisional uncommonness or exceptionalness. Um, uh, in my next video, I want to come back and think about how a reader response critic might um, 
might see something different.